hit that record button. So um, first of all, I just want to say hi, Donna. Hi, Jennifer. So um, hello, everybody. Oh, hello. Um, so for those of you who are maybe, I mean, you came to Warwick's event, so you are familiar with Warwick's by via the computer and getting a registration for this. But some of you may not know where we're located or what our, our little backstory is. So Warwick's is in La Jolla, Cal uh, San Diego, California. And I was telling Donna and Jennifer in the green room that we are actually celebrating our 125th anniversary this year. So nice. um, we've lived through, um, this will be our second pandemic that we're living through. So <laughs> we are going strong and doing well. So if you are in the um, San Diego La Jolla area, we would love for you to come into the store and visit us. Um, nothing better than coming in and looking at all the wonderful stacks of books. Um, so for today's event, some of you have purchased the book to get in, and I will also be putting it into the uh, comment section so that you can um, easily click that. We can ship it to you, but if you're in the area, come by and see us. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for um, who helped put this together. Don, I think this is the first time that we have hosted you, and so I am just thrilled that you are here with us because you are a beloved author at the store and customers and so everybody adores you and I'm just thrilled that you're here with us so thank you thank you thank you adores your book so we're getting to know my head expands. here we go <laughs> <laughs> so um and thank you to Grove for allowing us to do this today um I think I've given everybody enough time I always like to try to start on time to reward those that have joined us early I will comment to people we're recording it so people can always come in and and um uh, review it later on our YouTube channel if they miss anything today. So, um, did I miss anything, Jennifer? Did I did I fill all the all those things? I think I told everybody no, everything. I think you, I think you got it. Yeah. yeah. Jennifer's done. Donna. Den Jennifer has done a number of these events with us since the shutdown, and we could not do it without her. So, um, hmm, we uh, and a lot of people who are out there listening may have heard me sh this spiel a, a bunch of times too, because we get lots of good people who join us. So let me tell you a little bit about Jennifer, and then I will toss it away. Um, Jennifer and Donna are going to chat for about 35 minutes. There's a way for you to participate. If you scroll over your screen, there's a Q&A button down there. So feel free to go ahead and put um, any questions into that um, Q&A section. Um, I'm not going to bring those in live. I'll bring those in after um, Donna and Jennifer chat for a little bit. But um, we always love the audience questions. So hopefully somebody has some good questions for us. So a little bit about Jennifer. So Jennifer is a personal branding expert, digital marketing strategist, and host of the Premise podcast, which this will be on in a couple of weeks, I think. So tell your friends about it too. She's an author and speaker who delivers mm -hmm. strategy-rich content and actionable tools that educate and empower authors. She and her husband, Chad, co-founded Monkey See Media in 2004 and have been creating award-winning book cover designs and author websites ever since. Jennifer is a co-founder of the San Diego Writers Festival, which will be happening in July this year. So look at that website too. She serves on the board of San Diego Memoir Writers Association and is currently writing her own coming of age memoir. So with that, ladies, have a great conversation. And we'll see you in about a half hour or so. Thank you, Julie. Hi, Donna. It is Hello. so nice to meet you. How are you? Fine, fine. Good. You're in Switzerland, yes? Yeah. Yeah. Lovely. Lovely. Well, welcome to uh, San Diego. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to read your bio to our listeners real quick, and then we'll dive into the interview. Donna Leone is a New Yorker of Irish Spanish descent. Donna Leone first went to Italy in 1965, returning regularly over the next decade or so while pursuing a career as an academic in the States and then later in Iran, China, and finally Saudi Arabia. She has worked as a travel guide in Rome and as a copywriter in London. Leon has received both the CWA McAllen Silver Dagger for fiction and the German Corinne Prize for her novels featuring Commissario Guido Brunetti. She lives in Switzerland, as we just said. So welcome today. We're really excited. I'm really excited to talk about this. This was a really fun book to read. In fact, I've got it here to show our viewers. Kind of gives you an idea of what's going to happen in this book, Transient Desires. But I want to talk about the series. This is the 30th book in your series with Commissario Brunetti. Yeah. Where did the idea for Brunetti come from? How did he come to you? 
I was in um, the dressing room of La Fenice, the, the opera theater in Venice, 30 years ago, 33 years ago, chatting with a friend of mine who was conducting um, Donizetti's La Favorite. Mm. He and his wife and I were in the conductor's dressing room and the, the name of another conductor came up whom none of us liked for personal reasons. He was an excellent conductor. Well, he was a, a very good conductor, but he, he was not a particularly nice person. And so I thought, wow, what a great idea for a book, a murder mystery. And he could be killed here in the dressing room. Why don't I try to write a murder mystery? But it was just one of those things. If I had not been there for that conversation, I wouldn't have written the book. So we wouldn't oh my be God. having the conversation. That's incredible. Well, I wrote it and it got published and, and they wanted another one and then they wanted two more. And I had so much fun writing them that I mm -hmm. kept writing. It just kept happening. When you first sat down to write Brunetti, did you think, oh, this is going to be a series or were you just no, no, having no, no, fun? No, 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 no. I just wanted to have fun. I, I wanted to see if I could write a murder mystery. I was simultaneously working on my doctoral dissertation yeah. on uh, the title was not Death at La Fenice. The changing moral order in the universe of Jane Austen's novels. It's wow. a long way from a murder mystery. Totally. But, uh, I had been in grad school far, far longer than any person should have been in grad school. <laughs> and because I spent the day doing research or teaching at night, I didn't want to read anything real. Yeah. So I read murder mysteries. And gradually, the um, the patterns, the tropes, the, the necessary elements sunk into my head unconsciously so that when I yeah. set out to write, I knew that I had to have a um, protagonist. I had to have a, a probably male detective, investigator, policeman, something. There had to be a good guy and a bad guy. Someone had to be killed. And yeah. so the, the book started itself it started rolling itself because there were those were the requisites for a, a murder mystery yeah that's incredible i love that story and you know brunetti is really kind of the perfect man i mean he's suave he's shrewd he's observant but he's also incredibly sensitive so he's this like perfect masculine but with the, the right amount of feminine <laughs> and i mm -hmm. wonder like is he would you consider him to be the ideal man your ideal man well, he's, he's a shocking racist, but that passes unobserved in, in the books. I um, wonder though, I want to interrupt you for that because like that came up in this book and mm -hmm. I got the sense that like this, this idea that like Venetians and, and Neapolitans, you know, don't like each other came up, mm -hmm. but he felt, he seemed to feel ashamed by that later. So is he a racist? Well, if you... If you assume that a person, because of some accident where they live, what color they are, what language they speak, what religion they are, are somehow different and mm. invariably inferior, then mm -hmm. I suppose you're a racist. Or you, you can call it different things. And this is sure. it's really a question of culture and geography. It, and it's, it's certainly not as, as um, virulent as is racial racism based on race or religion uh, or gender, but it is a strong antagonism between the different parts of Italy. They were separate countries until about 150 years ago. And so oh, that explains a lot. They, okay. they do feel the otherness of the, mm -hmm. other, the other person. And yeah. they have their own set fixed ideas about what Sicilians are like, what Neapolitans are like this, what Milanese are like. And there's, there's very little shaking that. I ha I've lived, I, I guess I lived for 40 years in Northern Italy, that was my choice. But I've heard people say, Venetians say, and, and people from the Veneto make remarks about Southerners that have left me with my mouth open. Mm. Because yeah. They're not prejudices. They're not. I don't. They don't make sense to me because they're they're not my prejudices. I think all of us believe that our prejudice, well, they're based on fact. The other people yes. are based on folly and prejudice, but not right. mine. I know that they are, blah 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 blah. 
So true. Well, and there's a scene where Claudia Griffoni, mm -hmm. forgive me if I pronounce that no, incorrectly. She's from Naples. And there's this scene where Guido is all of a sudden sort of judging her for, you know, letting her accent slip. And, mm -hmm. you know, he's having this internal struggle with it as it's playing out. Mm -hmm. And then later he's like, so he apologizes and she calls him out on it too. Mm -hmm. Did you create her sort of to offset that? I mean, what, was there a reason that you chose Claudia to be no, from no, Naples? No, no, no. I, I don't have reasons. They just happen. Yeah, it they just, just are. She just walked into a book, a book about 10 years ago because I felt the need for another police person of equal rank with Brunetti. And I thought, well, why not make her a woman? And I thought, well, let's shake things up a bit and make her Neapolitan. I love that. <laughs> and it, well, and I, I imagine you use that tension. It's tension, but it's not tension because mm -hmm. most, most Northern Italians accept the fact that Neapolitans and Sicilians are wonderfully funny and patient and generous and well-dressed and clever, but they still have that feeling that there's mm -hmm. something untrustworthy about them. Mm -hmm. And since yeah, I'm not an Italian and my family is not Italian, I, th it just doesn't, I find them charming beyond words, but I, yeah. I, I listen. And so I become aware of their prejudices. It's one of the good things about living out of one's country. Mm -hmm. you, you learn that other people have prejudices. Sure. Absolutely. And they're different well, from I'm yours. Yeah, exactly. And I love what you just said that like, well, my prejudices are, you know, based on fact, right? Like I'm not prejudiced. This is how it no. is, but me no. Is it true that your books have never been translated into Italian? No, they haven't been. And they, they, they won't be during my lifetime. I find that very interesting. Is that your choice? That's my choice. Everybody thinks I'm crazy, but I'm not. Um, I, I am really not interested in, in, um, in fame. I find the, the whole idea of the celebrity mm. culture that we, we live in, I find it really unpleasant and stupid. And so I don't, I don't have to be a part of it. Also, what I am afraid of is that Italians who don't read the books, but who mm -hmm. read about the books, will read right. about a non-Italian who writes Writing books about in which Italy is criticized, where sure. one talk, the, the books point out corruption, dishonesty, murder, this and that. And they will, I think, understandably not like it that it's a foreigner saying these things. Yeah. And I don't, I don't want to put up with that. And I don't have to put up with that. And you don't My have Italian to. Friends, <laughs> I, don't, I don't have to because I don't have to publish your books in Italian. So they won't read, they won't read about them. None of my, none of it, the Italians who have read the books, whether they are my friends or strangers who come to book readings, has ever said anything to suggest that they are offended by anything I say about Italy. Mm. Certainly the Italian writers, particularly the Italian crime writers, say far worse things than I do. And, sure. and I like to think that my, my love for them and my love for the place comes through in the books. I don't, I don't know that, but I would like to think it. Well, it does. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. I, it was very clear that you lived and spent a lot of time in Venice and in Italy. Your love for the people, the food came through, mm -hmm. um, you know, as Brunetti, of course. Yeah. He, he's very cultured. He, he loves good food. He complains if there's bad coffee. And mm -hmm. I just imagine that being pretty common in, in Italy, yeah. Yeah. you know, you just sort of expect good coffee. And if you don't get it, you're going to be disgruntled, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> the beauty, um, all of it. In, in this particular book, he takes public transit, a very specific uh, railway mm -hmm. for the first time. And I thought that was fascinating that, you know, after 30 books, this character has never gotten on, on, on this particular railway. And it just gave me a sense of like the people and how people commute, how they get places in the, in the waterways. Mm -hmm. And I did, I did have a sense of being there. And I've never been. So I think, you, I think you did well. One of the things that I found interesting too was Brunetti's criticism of tourism and cruise ships mm -hmm. in particular. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I could give you, uh, rather than talk about it, I can give you numbers. At the, no, when last I checked, which was about three years ago, there's, there's a pharmacy in the center of the city. Mm. And 
he has a, a little ticker thing that's connected to the, the office in the Comune, in the, the city hall, that takes registration of who lives there. Mm -hmm. The last number for residents in Venice was less than 53,000. There were fewer than 53,000 residents of the city of Venice. In the years before COVID, there were 30, 30 million tourists. So if you roll those, those numbers That's around- a lot of people. Pinball machine head, they mm -hmm. come up very unpleasantly. It's unbearable, mm -hmm. it, it was unbearable. Last week, I received a photo from a friend of mine who was out in the Grand Canal rowing one day. And she sent me a picture of what she saw from the Rialto Bridge, which was a, a mirror-like surface of undisturbed water way down to the end where the, the Grand Canal curves to the left to go out to San Marco. Mm. No boat, no human, no wind, no bird, <laughs> nothing. And what struck me was that if you look down that, that view, you could have been seeing what was seen 400 years ago. Right. Mm -hmm. there, were, there were no human beings. I've never seen that because I haven't, I haven't been there. I was there for five days in November, but otherwise I haven't been there for a year and three months because I can't, I can't get there. I can't yeah. go. Yeah. The same is true in New York. You know, the, the number of tourists in New York City, Manhattan in particular, mm -hmm. is over. It's incredible. Yeah. I, I wonder if they're experiencing the same thing now with, with less tourism, perhaps, due to the pandemic. Yeah, I, I think tourism is, is diminished everywhere. Mm -hmm. But I, I am of a mind that as soon as the flags get pulled down and people can travel where they want, tourists will return in masses to Venice because yeah. the city is based, it's mono, it's monoculture. They mm -hmm. plant only a certain kind of wheat in that city. And yeah. so once a wheat uh, bowl, a weevil gets into the crop, COVID. Yeah, it's all crop, over. <laughs> and the crop dies, hey, it's finished. You have got nothing to harvest. And the economic consequences have been pretty severe for the city. Oh, I'm sure, yeah. Well, one thing about Brunetti is, you know, he complains in a very elegant manner, I think. It's, it's not overt. And he even says, you know, I'm not going to get into a conversation about it. It is what it is. I can't change it. And yeah. I, I find that That's wisdom. That's wisdom. Yeah, it's his wisdom. Well, let's talk about Brunetti's wisdom. So he has changed over time. You have changed over time. What has it been like? Grow right. We all hope we're getting wiser a little bit. How has it been aging, growing older with your main man, with your character? And how much has he changed? Well, he's, he's darker. He's um, mm. seen more of life. And uh, I, I think in him is manifest the same kind of, of um, Manichaean nature that I see in myself. That is that intellectually, historically, mm. he's much, much darker and much mm. more pessimistic because the future for our planet is, and I'm not, I'm not gonna give that lecture. The future for our planet is very pessimistic. It's, it's pretty grim. The, the coming years are going to be very, very grim. But personally, he's a happy man because he lives mm. in happy circumstances. He has people around him who love him and whom he loves to distraction. Mm. And, so, and, and he has a rich life. He reads, yes. he's a cultured person, and he, he thinks about things. He has an intellectual life and he has intellectual st stimulation. And so as he is becoming, he's aging like a good wine, but yeah. the rest of the world isn't. So he mm -hmm. finds himself as an observer, both of himself, because he is a reflective person, and of the people around him. And I think this is one of the things that, it's certainly one of the things that I enjoy about him, that he is, he's capable of being very interesting in conversation. He yeah. has conversations, but usually they are interesting because they are of substance, not just who killed whom, 
yeah. but about what's going on in the world. Why is this going on in the world? Mm -hmm. Why do people behave this way? What are the historical influences upon that? And yeah, I think yeah. conversations become one of the parts of the books that many people do enjoy because well, it's not just shoot them up, bang, bang. Exactly. It's really not about the crimes or even no. the mystery. It's really about the connection, the human connection. And like you say, why people do the things they do. Why are people so dark? Why do people make these terrible choices? But, and he but I think if, if you look at, that. sorry, but if, if yeah. you look at the history of crime fiction, Agatha Christie is interested in who? Yeah. The writers of the golden age were interested in who, who done it. In fact, they're called who done it's because the, the question could be answered with the name of the person who drove the knife in, who put, tied the noose around. But today's crime fiction usually asks why? Yeah. And very often in today's crime fiction, the why is not a who, who was, who was dissed by somebody or who was divorced by someone or offended by someone or cheated by someone, mm -hmm. but by very complicated inter, inter spaghettied strands of human activity. So the, the reason for a crime is very, very complex. One person does it, but he does it because he's protecting some vast system of dishonesty. Mm -hmm. And I, I find that much more interesting than whodunit because whodunit, I, you, you can, there are exceptions. There's the opening line of Ruth Rendell's Judgment in Stone. I think Ruth Rendell was the, the best, the best of the, the modern uh, crime writers. The first sentence of her Judgment in Stone is Eunice Coverdale, no, Eunice Parchman killed the Coverdale family because she could not read or write. So she gives you the name of the killer, the name of the victims and the motive in the first sentence of the book. And then she goes on for another 300 pages, keeping you going, <gasps> No, that's not going to happen because you know it's going to happen. It's, it's breathtakingly ingenious, this technique of revealing everything and right, then right. explaining. And it creates a peculiar kind of horror in the reader because they know when someone says something, when someone says something insulting that they don't know is insulting, they know what's going to happen, that Eunice Parchment is going to kill them. Right. It feels oh, very crime and punishment like in a way. Yeah. 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 It is. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder, you know, when you see things in the world that frustrate you or even en enrage you, there's a lot to be enraged about these days. Do you find yourself thinking about how Brunetti would look upon no. this situation and how he would handle it? No, I don't. Never. No, I'm, I'm, I really separate the books from um, my own responses. And, and very often my responses are not his or would not be mm. his. That's wonderful. He's his own character, yeah. lives in your head. Yeah. How do you come up with your ideas for the next adventure for Brunetti? How do they come to you? Well, I'm lucky in that um, Venice is a very small city. And so there are many human contacts that we all have. We know lots of people. And we have contact and we learn gossip from lots of people. And so <laughs> many, many books have come to me as a result of a chance encounter on the street with someone who says, oh yeah, did you hear about? There is also my favorite newspaper on the planet, Il Gazzettino, which is the local Venetian newspaper. It is sublime in its superficiality. <laughs> but it, 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 perfect it, fodder, it, I take it. <laughs> oh, the Daily News could close down. The New York Post would be driven out of business by this newspaper. The um, they they love um, disaster. They love uh, <laughs> crime. They love young death. They love automobile accidents where people go into a drive off at three o'clock in the morning, and they invariably say. Any, any reader of the Gazzettino will recognize this. So the, the story tells about the four kids in the Alfa Romeo who at three o'clock in the morning, returning from the discoteca, drive off the road and do all sorts of disastrous things to themselves. And the cause mm -hmm. is always un colpo di sono. He fell asleep at the wheel. Oh, There's never goodness. any mention of alcohol or drugs. Really? Never, I have never read that attributed 
in That's the Gazette, which is probably when you think about it, it's probably very, very kind of mm. them. And this is very Italian. Mm. It's mm. kind of them not to put in the newspaper, especially if somebody, the driver's killed, but a passenger is killed. It's horrible for the, the parents of the driver to know it, but maybe it's more horrible for the, the, the parents of the kids who were in the car accidentally. So I yeah. always applaud the, the Gazzettino for not putting that information in. Don't That's the dirty them. laundry, right? That we love so much in America. Yeah, yeah. And I, I think obviously the parents were told, yeah. the insurance company was told, but why does, why does Signora Garibaldi have to know that? Mm -hmm. That's private stuff. Mm -hmm. So my, my love affair with the Gazzettino is based on, on how awful it is, but how, how kind it is as well. And that's interesting because, you know, in this book, there's a lot of kindness that I see in Brunetti and the way things are handled. And, mm -hmm. you know, he, he really cares about the characters, even like the, the worst one, the antagonist mm -hmm. um, in, in this particular book, who is Borgato, hopefully mm -hmm. I pronounced that correctly. Mm -hmm. he, he's like, why does he do it? He, he's analyzing it. Why did he do it? Is it greed? Is it, is yeah. it money? You know, yeah. it's, it's interesting. So I wonder if that kind of comes from your reading, you know, that kindness and just the, the Italians in general. Yeah, Italians are kind. They are. If, if disaster ever fell upon me, I would want it to happen in Italy because somebody, somebody would help me. Mm. And probably a lot of people would help me. Yeah. I once, I once was in a, a bus in a northern country, which I will not name, and the bus stopped very abruptly and knocked me to the floor. So here's mm. this white haired old lady lying on the floor of the bus. <laughs> Nobody even looked at me. Really? And I, was, I, I wasn't hurt. I just, I was lying on the bottom of the bus. I was outraged because if that had happened in Italy and the farther south, the truer it would have become. Mm -hmm. It would it have been helped you out. picking me up. Signora, should we stop the bus? Should, can we drive to the hospital? Can, can, can we stop the bus and get you some water? Would you like to be helped? Do you need? They, yeah. they would be all over me. But there, yeah. no one looked at me. And I thought, God, e viva l'Italia. God bless Italy. Yeah. For that, that instinctive impulse of want that I have found in them for 50 years. Beautiful. Yeah, I'm fascinated by people who don't step up to help as a certain type of person. You know, mm -hmm. I, I would always, I have to tell you a funny story. One time I was running on a treadmill and I fell. And I was holding myself up by the side and there's a little red button you hit to do stop. And there was a guy running on a treadmill right next to me and I'm holding myself up and my legs are flying out behind me. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm going to have to let go. You know, my brain is racing, trying to get uh -huh. myself out of this predicament. And finally my pants were pulled off of my body and I'm in my underwear because the treadmill took the pants and they flew off. And I'm like, that's it. So I let go went flying off the back of this treadmill. And I got up and I walked over to the guy next to me. I said, why didn't you hit the stop button? And he was like, he just had this look on his face. Like, well, it wasn't, it didn't involve me. Fascinating. I could I never be that him. person. I hope you hit him. I didn't. I, I laughed. Well, I, I was fine. I was okay. But I was like, that's so fascinating to me that people, so I'm glad to know that it Italians, someone in Italy would have hit the stop button for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They would have. Or someone would have just picked you up and... You know, I love Paola. She's so beautiful. And you can tell that, Bru you know, Guido just loves her too. Mm -hmm. And in the very beginning of the book, like they have, it goes home for lunch and, and she's a wonderful cook and she's an aristocrat and she's an educator and she's well-read and he has so much love for Paola. It really comes through in the book, right? Which I think is part of his humanity. Mm -hmm. I wonder for you, what does Paola represent in this relationship? Where, where did you, why did you bring her in? Well, when I wrote the first book, I knew that he would need a wife because he was a man in his forties, an Italian mm -hmm. man, a professional. Mm -hmm. So he would have gone to university, probably have a degree in law. And that's where we meet our first sweetie and maybe our husband, maybe our wife in at university. Mm -hmm. And because I'm, I'm a wise ass and a show off with English <laughs> literature. Yeah. 
I needed someone who could mm. throw out a reference to Emily Dickinson or John Donne or Milton. Yes. yes. So if she had been an Italian professor, a professor of Italian literature, I can do it. But I, I would just be picking the cherries, the, the things mm -hmm. that La Chate, Ogni Speranza, Voi Che Entrata, all that stuff. But this way, she can quote the more obscure people. And that way, you have to have more fun. Are I clever? Are I clever? Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. I love that. And you studied Jane Austen when you were getting your PhD. Yeah. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Yeah. I want to talk about something that happened to you in 1978 and 79. You were teaching in Iran, working toward your PhD, and um, made a very hasty evacuation. I understand <laughs> that you were on a bus at gunpoint. Can you share yeah. us a little more? Yeah, yeah. Well, we were we were evacu evacuated. Um, I was teaching for the, the the Iranian military. In fact, a friend of mine who was in Iran is one of the, one of the people listening to this tonight. Mm. She, she lives in San Diego. Um, and we were driven overnight from Esfahan, where I was living, where I had lived for about four years, to Tehran, where we'd get on the Pan, Pan American flights, mm. paid, for by our, paid for by our company because the United States government ignored Wouldn't us. Do it. Of course. They, we, nothing, <sighs> zero. Wow. And at about three o'clock in the morning, the bus was pulled over. It was a little yellow school bus, as I remember, a little, uh, I don't know, some kind of bluebird a yellow school mm. bus and a, a bunch of guys, young kids, 17, 18, 19, with turbans and, and beards, they got on and they had machine guns and they walked down the aisle of the bus pointing the, the um, flashlights in our faces and, and holding the, the Kalashnikov at our, at our faces. Mm. But even though the, the, it sounds terrifying, there, there was no violence in them. There was no menace in them mm. they they the kalashnikov was sort of decor i don't oh. think that that there was a sense that we were really in danger in that circumstance mm. it was it was not very nice sure. but um we they, they and they left and and they were to a certain degree they were polite and the bus continued to tehran and we got on our plane and we all left Wow. Wow. And what we, had, we had no bad experiences. The, the company for which I worked had, I don't know, 100 people working and no, nobody was menaced, nobody was trouble. In fact, in fact, about a week before we were evacuated, um, our next door neighbor in the, in the city where we lived in, in Esfahan came to the door and said, the guy I lived with spoke Farsi. He was American, but he spoke Farsi very well. And she said, sir, we have heard on the radio, we know you don't listen to the radio, that those, the water in the city has been poisoned. We don't know who did it, but we have a well. If you need water, please come and get your water from us. Oh, wow. So I thought, mm, okay. People are people. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, if you can help your neighbors, you do. I know that you have a, a mind for, for social justice. I, I can tell that you care deeply about social justice. I can tell it in the book and in Brunetti's character. But I also know that you dedicated one of your books to Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Yeah. Yeah, I, I thought yeah, that we was... were friends. Um, okay. She's someone I respected and ad mm -hmm. admired. Um, mm -hmm. But with, with Ruth was so overwhelmingly herself that I think one respected her. Mm -hmm. instantly and then came to like her and I was lucky enough that I knew her well enough to do both yeah yeah she was incredible yeah she was her legacy lives on for sure that so, must have been kind of an incredible experience to be able to dedicate one of your books to her what made you decide to do that well I I, I dedicate the books to the people I love hmm. and I have I have since the beginning mm-hmm Looking forward, do you, do you look to the future of Bernetti retiring? No, 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 I'll do it as long as it's fun. It's still enormous fun. It makes me laugh out loud still. Nice. Yeah. And um, I'll do it as long as I, I feel like doing it because when and if it happens that it's not fun and I don't enjoy doing it, nobody's going to enjoy reading it. And so mm -hmm. 
publishing it becomes an act of dishonesty on my part. And hmm. so I have to stop. Yeah. And say, I'd either did she chow chow. But that <laughs> I'm nowhere near that because I'm I'm writing the last chapters of 31. I'm almost finished with it. And I think I have an idea for 32. Awesome. <laughs> That's wonderful. What else am I gonna I'm do? Like- we're we're in lockdown. Well, this is true. This is true. Tell me about your process for for writing these books. Is it true that you write one a year? Yeah. So talk to me about your process of how you stay on track and manage to accomplish such a feat. I take notes. Um, I Because my memory is so bad, I have notes and notes and notes and notes and notes of what happened in chapter one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. So when I, when I think... To, what did he say when he was talking to? I look at the notes and I find out what. Uh, the uh, so I write one. I don't. I don't have a. Do- I don't have a day, a day job. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. there's not a lot of competition for my time, except with uh, my involvement with the opera world. I've been, as I said before, I've been in in the world of opera for the last thirty years, and I work with and sometimes perform with and have a, a vote in what gets done with a, um, a Baroque opera orchestra, Il Pomodoro, which was nominated for a Grammy. Oh, wonderful. It lost. That's nice. Agrippina but it was lost nominated. to yeah. uh, a deservedly very, very good opera film. Huh. And I understand that you have a deep passion for Baroque music. I've- yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. Well, what a wonderful way to spend your days, one writing and two, you know, with your passion with music. I want to get back to the writing though. So you have flashbacks to things that happened, not flashbacks, but references or nods to things that happened. Do you have deep notes that you kind of reference when you're writing a book or do they just come to you like, oh, that I don't make a a plan. When I start a book, I have no idea what's going to happen. Wow. I never have. No, in in one book, the fourth book, I I read an article about um, snuff films which are rumored, no, no one knows whether they exist, although they probably do, where there's a sex scene and the woman, the woman who has, is the participant in the sex scene gets killed, but she really is killed. So it's a sex and murder film. I read about that and it so horrified me that I knew that the next book I wrote would be about that. Like a snuff like, film, you mean? A snuff film, about the making oh. of snuff films. I knew that was going to be the motive, but when I started the book, I had no idea of what was going to happen in the book, but I know that I knew that whatever whatever did happen was going to happen because of snuff films. That mm-hmm. someone took a couple of steps towards rage farther than I did, and acted on the rage that was was caused. But otherwise, I just start I start telling a story. I, maybe I read something in the Gazzettino, or someone tells me a story about something that they know. And then I write the scene that initiates an activity or maybe an investigation. And then as as the book develops and I continue writing, it becomes clearer and clearer where I'm going. But very often, not until the final three or four chapters do I I finally say, ah, yeah, that's why, Mm -hmm. that's who. Do you ever start like an idea or a scene and then you just abandon it and think, no, that's not going anywhere? No, no. You just keep meandering until you get to it. Yeah, sooner or later it'll turn right. But then I go back, the next day I go back and and rewrite. Got it. I'm a great believer in rewriting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you know it when you've got it. I'm a lazy sod, so I don't want to throw away 10 pages. Just, (laughs) it's like leftovers. You don't throw them out. Yeah, you, you throw in a little tofu and a little of this, and then you eat them the next day. And you fix them. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Well, this has been a lovely conversation. Thank, Thank you, you so much. My pleasure. Blah blah blah. Yeah. No, it's been wonderful. Let's so show our viewers "Transient Desires" by Donna Leon. Am I saying your name right? Is it Leon? Or Leon? Uh, if If I'm in America, people say Leon. If I'm in Europe, people say Leon. Leon, thank you. I should ask you that. It's a Spanish name. Yes, of course. Which is Italian on your grandfather, uh, paternal no. grandfathers? No. My grandfathers were Spanish and German, and both grandmothers were Irish. Oh, wow. Okay. Mm. 
I'm one of those lazy, irresponsible, sucking up to the public tit immigrants, foreigners, <laughs> I'm a product of that. Yeah, you're one of those. One of them, you and me yeah. Both. The thems. <laughs> you and all of us. <laughs> <laughs> with we a have a lot of with a Hispanic name to make it worse. We have a lot of questions. We have a lot of questions. Oh, cool. Yeah. Let's hear them. Love, love, love. So thank you everybody for all of your great questions. So some of them go back to what you guys were talking about in the earlier part of the conversation. So Stephanie would like to know, why did you move to Switzerland and will you continue to base your series in Venice? Yeah, I moved to Switzerland because I couldn't stand living in Venice anymore. Because when I moved there, there might have been 50,000 people living there and maybe 100,000 tourists a year. But uh, now there's 30 million tourists and I, I don't want to live with that. And I won't live with that. It, it, it's the migration of the wildebeest. You, you can't cross the street at times because there's so many people. Mm. No, thank you. I, now I live in a village with 350 people and 350 cows and that's just fine. That's, and, but the series that. will continue in Venice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 I, I can't write about anywhere else. I never lived anywhere else. Yeah. Well, when you were talking about what your friend's picture was, there was just another picture or something on the news about the dolphins that were in the canal. Yeah, the two of them. Day. Yeah, I have yeah. pictures in my computer. People yeah. sent them. I mean, it's just amazing. And when the first, when the lockdown first happened and they were showing pictures of that you could see to the bottom of the canal, I mean, mm -hmm. it was just humans ruin everything, don't we? <laughs> Well, it's we rumored do. to be true, yes. Rumored to be true there. Okay, Gwen has a question. If you hadn't been a novelist, what might you have been post-teaching? Oh, I don't know. I, I, I was a professor of English literature. I probably would have stuck with that. So yeah. yeah. Um, and you'd like to know, um, and I'm going to, I'm horrible at names and I apologize for butchering. Will Graffoni, is it Graffoni? Graffoni, yeah. Will will uh, Graffoni ever have her own series? No, probably not. I don't. I don't have the time. No. No. Um, yeah, because what was it? The quote that somebody said that you could uh, the, you could um, clock the ter Paris trains by your release of a novel every year. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and but which brings me to a thing, do and this is my question sorry everybody that's watching i'll get to your questions but i have one too the titles do you come up with those or are they um is it do they come to you or are they hard what about no, no they, they they come to me my favorite is about face because they they drive my my german publisher crazy because very <laughs> often there, there's a double meaning so in about face which is about a woman's multiple facelifts about face. It's also about her honor, about keeping face. And it's also a book in which everybody marches along th 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 in this direction. And then the book says about face and they go back because they've been going the wrong way. Mm -hmm. my, I thought my, my German publisher was going to cry when I gave him the book and I said, the title is about face. <laughs> they, couldn't, they couldn't do it because the, the linguistic rules are such that very often the, the joke doesn't work in, in the other language. Uh, too bad. Yeah, yeah. Oh, well, too bad. Right. <laughs> Tough on that. Um, does Brunetti, does he age annually or is he going to retire? I mean, how, how are you going to do that as you keep moving forward? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. He's, he's, he stayed. Maybe he's found the fountain of youth. No, he hasn't aged much. The problem really is the kids because the kids are in their 40s. But. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> um okay uh ellen's just commenting in manhattan these days when you guys were talking about the pre-pandemic um these, every day is like a sunday morning there so they speaking about how people the the tourism um esther would like to know have you been approached to serialize a book or brunetti or a netflix type presentation yeah there are a couple of people nipping at my heels. There's uh, somebody in England who wants to do a, a radio series. I'm not, I'm not wild for that idea. And there's a, a film producer in England who's very interested in, in doing a series of films. And we, are, we aren't negotiating. We're just talking back and forth. Um, OK, and then. So it's possible. It's possible. Yeah. It's, it, they, there's, so, there's so many complications to that. I mean, there's, right. but um, it's always so great, but 
Okay, uh, you've already answered this one for Joel. He wanted to know if you will wake up and say that was the last Brunetti novel. And he says, hopefully not. No. <laughs> so that's fun. Yeah, exactly. It's like, hey, that's with everything. As long as you're having fun, it's, you know, you'll never work a day. It's a little thing. You'll never work a day in your life. <laughs> um, Tom would like to know, can you talk about the development of Signorina Electra? How do you decide on names for your characters? Electra is modeled sort of on, on a person who had an aunt whose name really was Electra. And so I needed someone who knew how to use a computer. And so I dragged in Signorina Electra, who knows how to do everything. And I am so ignorant about computers that I almost can't explain what she knows how to do. <laughs> so I just give her the job. I said, Electra, could you, could you break into the figure Pentagon and get me a cheese sandwich, please? And she does it. <laughs> and she figures it out. <laughs> and so, um, and your names you just pick out from people you know, or? I read doorbells. I read the names of the journalists in the Gazzettino and La Nuova Ver Interesting. Oh, did we lose did we lose sound or is that me? Can you still hear me, Jennifer? Okay. I somehow lost sound, so but that's okay. Um who are the writers you most admire and or from whom you des derive inspiration? If we limit it to crime writers, I would say it's um the, the Trinity is Ruth Rendell, uh, Chandler, and Ross McDonald. And, and in all three cases, it's because of the quality of their writing. Mm. They all write beautifully, beautifully well. Um, mm. and, and their styles are completely different. But they oh, and I love all... that too. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You, you know when you read the book, which of the three it's by. Yeah. Ruth has those long, involuted, convoluted sentences at times. Uh, Chandler has the one-liners, and McDonald has be really beautiful, elegant English prose. Interesting, yeah. That's that's what makes it so. I, I'm always amazed. Like, there's only so many letters that when you talk about like music, when you talk about music, there's only so many notes and a, and that people can mm -hmm. just keep creating and creating and putting the words in different ways that just are. It's it's mind boggling to me, but I love it yeah. that they're also doing. You would think it would be like the same, but it's not. Everybody. No, no, no. It's magic. Yeah, it's, it is magic. magic. Absolutely magic. Um, speaking of instruments, so Kathleen, what instrument do you play, and do you have it with you in don't. Switzerland? None. I don't. Okay. I'm not a musician. I'm a fan. Yeah. I'm a groupie. Like I'm a baroque opera. Group. I like that. The last one left. Well, that's. I mean, that's how I am too. Because everybody's like, "Oh, Julie, you're gonna have a read." No, I'm a reader. I read, 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 read. I can't even imagine trying to write. I don't have it. I, and so I love to read though. <laughs> um, okay, let's see what else we've got here. So um, when you were talking about leaving Iran, Sandra, the hostility of the Northern, oh no, sorry, this was something different. I wrote, Sandra has the hostility of the Northern Chinese towards Il Mary Donali. That's my husband's colleagues. At the Mary University. Donali, yeah, yeah, people from the South. Express was shocking. You have captured the atmosphere of, of Venice so wonderfully that I feel I'm back. And she wanted to know, do you know Sergei's film? Is it Molecol? Molecol? M-O-L-E-C-O-L-E. -E. What is that? Molecole? Yeah. Molecol? I don't know. Because I, I never go to the movies. Ah, mm. there you go. And let's see. Uh, somebody's asking, in Failing in Love, there were wonderful descriptions of being backstage at La Fenici. Is that how you say it? Did you have the mm -hmm. opportunity to go backstage during a production? Oh, yeah. I've spent years backstage in opera productions. And uh -huh. also at La Fenici. Yeah. And so the authors that you spoke about, are those the authors that you currently read to? I mean, do you, who, do you, who is there any current? authors that you would like to lift up somebody wants to know no 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 i don't i don't read much contemporary stuff anymore okay at all i read i'm reading the classics i love it love it um like and then somebody's asking have you what ever you thought about now? writing a play or a brunetti opera hmm. 
No, I've been asked to write opera libretti by a couple of people, but I don't know how to do that. It's, it's like saying to a carpenter, can, can you fix my light bulb? I, I, know, I know one crap and that's all I can do. It's like screenplays and all of that. So, um, well, that about um, wraps up our questions. I think there were a couple others in here. There were just some comments that were being made. So um, Donna, Jennifer, thank you. This was really fun. Yeah, this has been wonderful. <laughs> Fun. Sorry, am I throat Thank you, starting Donna. to go? It's so nice to meet you. The pleasure was uh -oh. mine, really. Good luck with your memoirs. Thank you. Talk Thank about you the house much. a lot and the and and the, the well water. Oh, I love it. Delicious. You will no, never I taste can't. water like well water. Mm. We were talking about it in the green well, room earlier about Jennifer's upbringing. Now it might be different now. Ooh, that's true. It might be after Before. fracking and the fasts. And um, they could put stuff true. in the earth. Yeah, our poor earth is in trouble. Oh, let's let's stop right there. Yeah, <laughs> we will we'll stop right there. Um, again, our, Jennifer, our you mentioned transient desires. Um, love, love, love that we were able to host you, Donna, um, in this very virtual world that we're all living in right now. It's it was a true pleasure. And I can't thank you enough for being yeah. here with the us. The pleasure was entirely mine, really. Thank you. Thank you. Um, mm -hmm. And as we go off, everyone, thank you for joining us. This will this is recorded. It'll show up on our YouTube page. And don't forget to buy books from Warwick's. Buy Donna's books from Warwick's. We love that when that happens. Um, thank you to Grove again. And um, when I end this, it's going to end it for both Donna and Jennifer. We're just all going to go off screen. So um, thank you. Have a great right. rest of your day. Thank you. Ciao. Bye. Bye, everybody. Ciao. Ciao.